Okay, it should be recording. Great. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. During the fall semester, English majors took a class on the novella, the short story, and the fairy tale traditions in Italy. Um, as part of the required reading for the class, students discuss selections from John Battista Basile's The Tale of Tales, using an English translation by our distinguished speaker, Professor Nancy Canepa. She's an associate professor at Dartmouth College, and she received a PhD from Yale University. She is author of several books. I will mention a few, Out of the Woods, The Origins of the Literary Fairy Tale in Italy and France, From Court to Forest, Basilos Lo Punto del Punti, and The Birth of the Literary Fairy Tale, Fairy Tale, Teaching Fairy Tales, The Enchanted Boot, Italian Fairy Tales and Their Tellers, and Dr. Canepa has translated Colodi's The Adventures of Pinocchio. She's currently working on a, a project that is tentatively titled Magic Italy, Place, Identity, and the Italian Fairy Tale. Before we begin, I would like to thank the Department of English and World Languages and the Library and Resource Center for co-sponsoring this event. A special thanks to Assistant Professor Quigley of Library Sciences, and to Wayne, our IT tech, who's helping me uh, record this this evening. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to have Professor Canepa at CSU Pueblo for her talk entitled, Entertaining the Marvelous, Gian Battista Basile's The Tale of Tales and the Rise of the Literary Fairy. The presentation will be followed by a brief question and answer session. And I'd ask you to see uh, Professor Canepa, you can go to the upper right-hand corner on view, and hit um, speaker instead of gallery, and she will be the main focus of the talk. Thank you. I'm not sure I like that idea. <laughs> My face <laughs> occupying the whole screen. <laughs> anyway, the PowerPoint will be up there uh, soon. Um, well, many thanks to, to Chris, to Professor Pichichi for inviting me also to, to Colorado State and the, the co-sponsors, and of course to you students. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to be able to speak to such a well-informed audience about fairy tales, about Basile's Tale of Tales. Um, that's sometimes not the case when I give talks on fairy tales. And I'm just so impressed. B B Professor Pichichi shared with me the selections uh, from the Tale of Tales that you read. And I, I was so impressed by, uh, by the fact that you read almost the whole, the whole work. Um, so uh, I, I, I love having this sort of audience. So now I'm going to share my screen. Um, I do have a PowerPoint and um, hopefully uh, a, a bit of visuals will help you um, follow the talk maybe a little bit better. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll be talking for about 40 minutes. Um, after which we'll have our discussion time. And I'll be very eager to, to hear what you think about, uh, you know, the ideas that I present to you, but also just Basile's text, what were, what were some of your impressions of it. I also wanna mention that I can share this PowerPoint if anyone is interested in, in taking a look at it afterwards, but you can all see that now, yes? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, let's see, I, okay, so. Uh, these three um, stills are, of course, from the Matteo Garrone film that you did see that film, correct? Correct. Yes, from the, his wonderful 2015 uh, Tale of Tales, his adaptation of, of just three of Basile's tales. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later uh, in the presentation. Oops, wait a minute. Uh... Okay, so this is kind of a, uh, uh, it's gonna be kind of a hodgepodge talk in that there's a lot of different topics that uh, that I want to um, uh, to treat. Hopefully all of these different threads will will kind of come together at the end in some kind of a coherent way and help us to to uh, you know understand Basile maybe a little bit better, Basile and his his wonderful collection. So I'm going to start with some background information on fairy tales and on Basile, who you see here on on the right. He looks like a Simpatico guy. Um, this is the first edition of, of, um, of the Tale of Tales. I'll be also talking about Basile's, what I call Basile's translation of popular and folkloric culture into the literary uh, arena. Um, I'll be saying a few words about 
who Basile was writing for, his intended audience, um, his relationship with the novella tradition, in particular Boccaccio. I know you read some tales from uh, his Decameron as well. Um, I will be using two tales, The Cinderella Cat and The She-Bear, to talk about how fairy tales engage with reality. And finally, we'll wrap things up with a discussion of the Garone uh, film and of adaptations of Basile in contemporary culture and, and of why that is, why this attraction to Basile uh, in, in the 21st century. Okay, um, storytelling is an essential human activity, right? We're all storytellers pretty much every day of our lives, or at least those days when we talk with other people. Um, it, it's, it's an activity that gives life meaning, that makes sense of this kind of amorphous mass of, of events that we, that we find ourselves in. Um, there are, of course, many different types of stories that we tell from myths and religious tales, uh, and legends to anecdotes, life stories, romances, news stories, Instagram stories, and so forth. And of course, fairy tales are included in there. Um, and it's very interesting how the forms and functions of the stories that individuals and communities tell can change really vastly over time and space. And investigating how and why that happens, how and why they're transported from one cultural context to another is really an important way of revisiting and understanding history, I think. Okay, fairy tales. Fairy tales are one of the most widespread and oldest and enduring forms of story, right? We're still very attracted to fairy tales, thousands of years uh, probably after they started being told. They initially circulated orally and it was only in the 16th century, at least in Europe, that they start to be written down by individual authors. Um, and they don't become a genre for children until the 19th century. So today we kind of associate fairy tales with, uh, with children's literature, but that was not the case at all for, uh, for, for much of their history, in fact. Fairy tales are about us. I'm not going to be commenting a lot on the the uh, you know visual material here, but I have, I've got to comment on this one. Um, Dina Goldstein, the artist Dina Goldstein, has a wonderful series called Fall in Princesses, where she kind of inserts Disney-like princesses in these very mundane <laughs> uh, uh, situations. It's it's a wonderful series, and I invite you to take a look at it. Um, anyway, fairy tales, um, on the one hand, establish a temporal and spatial difference from the here and now of our reality. And they do that straight off. So there are many fairy tales that, that, that start with a sentence like, once upon a time in a far off kingdom. So this is definitely not our world on the one hand. Um, on the other hand, fairy tales feature both fantastic and realistic people, creatures, and places who are involved in very relatable situations. So we can identify with what, what is going on in fairy tales, even if they're, they, they at the same time seem so unreal to us. Some of those characters are royalty, um, uh, marvelous supernatural creatures such as ogres, witches, and fairies, animals, often talking animals, and then children and parents, the young and the old, the smart and the stupid, the rich and the poor. Um, pretty much all types of uh, humanity. Fairy tales are coming of age stories that tell of maturation, initiation into adult life and identity formation. Thus the relatability, right? These are all <laughs> things that we, that we go through and always have gone through as, as human beings. They reflect deep psychological and social experiences and dramatize crucial family or human dynamics, such as, for example, sibling rivalry, parental overprotectiveness or negligence, intergenerational tensions, growing up and separating from one's family, um, having to prove one's worth and agency, often through struggle and tests and uh, overcoming obstacles, and negotiating courtship, sex, and marriage. And I'm sure you can think of um, innumerable tales that include actually all, all of this. 
And as such, fairy tales offer guides to behavior in the form of models of socialization and acculturation. And this is especially the case once fairy tales kind of enter into the realm of children's literature in the 19th century. And I'll be saying a bit about that uh, later. Um, a spoiler alert, this is the only reference <laughs> to Disney that you'll find in my presentation, although we can certainly talk about the whole Disney phenomenon afterwards. Um, just a, a few words about how fairy tales are generally structured. And I know you probably know this intuitively, but just to kind of review, many fairy tales start off with an initial lack or problem in the form of the departure of the protagonist from home or his or her estrangement from some kind of a normal domestic order. Um, the protagonist typically encounters antagonists, villains, but also uh, helpers, donors, et cetera. Um, and in the course of their uh, quest uh, or journey, they undergo tests, tasks, obstacles over which they ultimately triumph, usually with the aid of magic. Magic is a key element in, in fairy tales. Um, the hero or heroine discovers the object of their quest or search. And many fairy tales, although not all, and when I say fairy tales, I'm talking more about the traditional fairy tales. There are lots of kind of postmodern, uh, very uh, subversive rewritings of fairy tales that turn this whole paradigm kind of on its head. But in many traditional fairy tales, think the Grimm's uh, um, or, uh, or, or you know, the Disney films, um, finish with a happy ending in which the initial lack or problem is liquidated, the villains are punished, and the protagonist marries and or acquires riches, wisdom, and so forth. Fairy tales often are tales of social mobility, the kind of archetypal rags to riches tales, although we also find tales of restoration, we could say, in which we go from riches to rags to regaining the, the riches. In any case, fairy tales celebrate change, metamorphosis. Um, Fairy tales have this kind of uh, unique double attraction of variety and repetition. So what I, mean, what I mean by this is that on the one hand, fairy tales are universal. They exist all over the world. Um, the basic structure of a given tale type. So a tale type would be the Little Red Riding Hood tale type, the Cinderella tale type. So if I take a, a Little Red Riding Hood from ninth century China, and 17th century France, I'm gonna be able to recognize both of those as Little Red Riding Hood tales. They, they, have a, they have a similar kind of basic, basic sequence of actions or structure. On the other hand, fairy tales are also culturally specific. So each author, that Chinese author or teller and the French author or teller, fill the basic skeletal structure with what is important to them and their society. So they fill the tale, the tales out with details. Um, details uh, that uh, really show us how each retelling of a tale offers a very particular perspective or message, uh, particular to the time and place and you know, individual teller or author uh, that produced the tale. So the origins of the European literary tale. So we're going back four or 500 years or so, way before the Grimm's, Anderson, Disney. The Grimm's, Anderson, Disney are really uh, what are considered the classic uh, canon of fairy tales today. And the very first literary fairy tales of Italy and France, which are lesser known, um, actually are, have a very great importance and, and influenced all of those authors, but really never got to the point of having the uh, widespread diffusion with the general public that the Grimm's, uh, Anderson and Disney did. Um, the literary fairy tale first appeared in Europe in 16th century Italy. Um, first of all, in Giovanni Francesco Straparola's 
uh, The Pleasant Nights, published in 1550 to 53. Uh, this was a novella collection that included fairy tales, but wasn't entirely uh, devoted to fairy tales. Whereas Basile's Lo Conto de Licunti, which is the main topic of this presentation, uh, The Tale of Tales, published 80 or so years uh, after that, was a collection of only fairy tales. So really the first integral collection. These authored literary tales are generally more complex uh, in structure and language than oral tales, than the oral tales, the oral versions of many of the tales that had probably been told for, for, for many centuries, if not millennia before they entered into literary circulation. And this is in part because um, the, the, these early tales were written for a sophisticated court and salon audience. They weren't written for children. There really was no category of children's literature or children's culture per se. Um, so sophisticated adult audience. Um, and because of that, uh, a lot of these authors um, presented rather ambivalent or polemical messages or morals. Their fairy tales were less about uh, kind of uh, trying to teach something in a very didactic, didactic way um, and more about interrogating reality, using the fairy tale as a vehicle for cultural debate and social criticism. Why Italy? Um, so the first two collections that, that I mentioned both arose in Italy, one in Venice, Straparola's, one in Naples. Um, the, the role of Italian cities in international commerce was extremely important during this period. This, this period, the 1500s, is the Renaissance. Italy was really at the center of the Renaissance. And that facilitated contacts with other parts of the world, uh, in particular the Middle East and India. And so um, it was not only goods that were being exchanged, but also information and, and stories. Um, the Renaissance was a period of intense cultural activity, high literacy rates, innovation and experimentation with new forms and genres of which the fairy tale is, is one. Um, Renaissance culture was also um, relatively more secular than the previous church dominated medieval culture. And so there's a greater openness to uh, forms of the marvelous and the supernatural that are not Christian. In fact, in reading Basile, you, 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 you saw that the uh, you know, supernatural happenings don't really have nothing to do with, with, uh, with uh, Christian deities. There's, there's also in this period a fascination and a kind of proto-anthropological interest in exotic other cultures, such as the populations of the New World here, of the Far East, but also an interest in Europe's own native exotic of folk and popular culture, which up to this time had been kind of a submerged uh, culture. And so here you just see a, a map of Renaissance Italy. And again, I think it's no coincidence that the two cities where these collections first, uh, first emerged, uh, Venice and Naples were both very important ports places of trade and exchange. <clears throat> so just a very quick overview of the key texts in the history of the European literary fairy tale to situate us a little bit more. Um, I've already mentioned Straparola's Pleasant Nights, Basile's Tale of Tales, of course, 1697, Charles Perrault's Stories or Tales of Time Past, 1812, first edition of the Brothers Grimm's Children's and Household Tales, and 1835, first edition of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales. And we're kind of stopping in the 19th century. Of course, Disney, the Disney films have also become key texts. Um, but these are the kind of classic uh, texts up to the end of the 19th century. So let's uh, dig into Basile and his, his collection, uh, The Tale of Tales or Entertainment for Little Ones. This was first published in Naples uh, two years after the author's death in 1634 to 36. Uh, Basile was from Naples. He was a pretty successful writer, courtier, soldier, 
uh, at courts in Italy and abroad. And um, most of his works, he was kind of an elite intellectual in his role as a courtier. Most of his works, uh, because of that, were, were written in standard literary Italian, the, you know, the literary language of the time. Not the case for the Tale of Tales and uh, several other works, which were written in the uh, very experimental, non-standard language of Neapolitan dialect. This would, of course, limited would have limited the audience as well. Basile didn't um, didn't we think he didn't invent his tales from scratch, um, but kind of uh, got his raw materials, found these materials because many of his tales are variants of tale types that we find all over the world. Um, and that, that Basile kind of fills out, embroiders with his own, uh, his own um, uh, language and you know, idiosyncrasies and, and so forth. We think he might have found these uh, raw materials in his travels around the Mediterranean and especially during his time as an, as an administrator um, in rural areas of the Italian South, which have always been an extremely fertile area for folklore. And as I mentioned, uh, the audience of these early collections was an elite adult audience. We think Basile's tales first circulated in the small courts around Naples that he frequented and where they would have been used for conversation, entertainment, um, storytelling compositions, things like that. So the Tale of Tales is the first authored collection, integral authored, authored collection of fairy tales in Europe. Um, it contains, in fact, the first written versions of many of what would become canonical fairy tales, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, Rapunzel, Snow White, Hansel and Gretel, and others. It's distinguished, as you know, from reading so many tales by uh, a kind of crazy use of language, <laughs> over-the-top metaphor, descriptions, vulgarity, obscenity, um, some psychological character development, which is something that we don't typically find in fairy tales, lots and lots of references to the customs and the daily life of the time, thus all of those footnotes that I felt I had to include uh, in my translation. Um, Basile's tales also offer rather ambivalent messages often. Um, I, I, I see B B Basile's fairy tales as a kind of lens on the very um, uh, troubled reality in which he lived. The, the beginning of the 17th century was a period in Europe in general of wars, of natural disasters, of plagues, revolts. You see one, one famous uh, re revolt uh, that took place in Naples uh, in this painting here. Um, Basile's fairy tale world is a very complex one, which to some degree reflects the actual world that he lived in. So let's talk for a moment about translation. What did Basile translate in the Tale of Tales? Well, first of all, he translates from the language in which uh, oral folk tales circulated, in which he would have heard the tales, uh, which would have been dialects. Neapolitan dialect in Naples. He also spent some time in Calabria, another Italian region. He would have heard them in the different Calabrian dialect there. He translates uh, those languages that he heard the tales in to his own very idiosyncratic literary version of Neapolitan dialect. Um, he's been called a deformed Neapolitan Shakespeare for the very original way that he uses uh, language in his collection. And just a word on uh, dialects in Basile's time. So dialects were mother, tongue, mother tongues. They were the languages that people grew up speaking, the language spoken in the streets and in, in daily lives. Um, it really wasn't until the 17th century that uh, dialects began to emerge as literary languages. So that was a new phenomenon. And when they were used as a literary language, uh, it often involves some kind of polemical stance with regard to the canonical literary tradition written in, uh, in, in a different language. Basile also translates and catalogs the oral tales of magic that 
uh, in the words of the frame tale, old women tell for the entertainment of little ones, he translates them into the realm of literature. And he translates, as we've already mentioned, for a very literate courtly public. And in doing so, he borrows materials from many other genres and sources, ancient mythology, epics, theater, love lyric, etc. He often does this in a very comic way in which he kind of turns on their heads these, these traditions by inserting them in uh, often grotesque situations in his, in his tales. He also translates the Naples and the Italy of his time uh, via his descriptions of contemporary people, places, culture, and everyday life. The Tale of Tales is really an encyclopedia of the uh, 17th century in Naples and Italy. We get a lot of really good information about, um, about how people conducted their lives then, even, even in the kind of fantastic scenarios of the, of the fairy tales. Basile also translates, uh, I guess we can say that, the novella tradition into a new genre. So the Tale of Tales comes at the end of the medieval Renaissance novella tradition uh, for which Boccaccio's Decameron, which I know you read tales from, um, is really the European model at this point in time. But by the start of the 17th century, novella production is kind of on the decline. So how should we interpret Basile's passage from the novella to the fairy tale, his choice of the fairy tale as a new literary genre? On the one hand, um, the magic that is very often in fairy tales, the kind of motor of social betterment, the way characters can rise in the world, um, the, the acknowledgement of that uh, may be also a, a kind of pessimistic reflection on the fact that, um, that that's the only means, magic is the only means for rising uh, in a confusing reality that seems often governed by the hand of blind fortune. And um, you noticed, I, I'm sure that fortune is a topic in many of the introductions to the tales. So that on the one hand, on the other hand, the fact that many of Basile's fairy tale heroes triumph over all odds and obstacles. I mean, they, many of them do reach some kind of a happy ending, um, sometimes by virtue of their wits and street smarts in addition to the magic. Um, that also expresses, I think, a compensatory optimism in the face of stark realities. Um, on another note, bringing local folkloric traditions into the literary arena versus, uh, excuse me, via uh, through the use of a dialect, a local language, might also be an expression of municipal loyalty at a time of Spanish colonial rule in the south of Italy. Uh, the Spanish uh, viceroys were basically the occupiers of Southern Italy, including Naples at this time. Um, and finally, adopting a genre and language that was new, that officially had no place yet in the literary world, could have also been a way for Basile to comment more freely on the world around him and its hierarchies of power and so forth. There were no expectations for this genre. So just a word on Basile and Boccaccio. So we can definitely see Boccaccio's influence in the structure of the collection. I'm sure you, you talked about this in class. Um, both collections use a frame tale and in both collections, a group of 10 tale tellers are assembled to tell the tales. There are five days of storytelling in which 10 tellers tell a tale a day each. Sorry, that was kind of a tongue twister. Uh, in Basile and in Boccaccio, same structure, but 10 days. So Boccaccio is kind of twice what Basile is in terms of length. Um, and the simulation of an oral tale telling situation continues to structure both works even uh, beyond the frame tale. So each day in both collections is preceded and ended by food, entertainment, gaming on the part of the um, fictional frame audience. And each uh, individual tale contains the description of the reaction of the fictional frame audience of the tale tellers to the previous tale. They discuss whether it was a good, uh, a good uh, story or not, 
um, as well as the tale teller's introduction to the tale she's about to tell. Um, and so just kind of zeroing in for a moment on the frame tale in both of these collections. Frame tales, of course, uh, generate the tales, the, the, the mass of tales that they contain, but they also emphasize the power of storytelling as a vital existential tool and often as a means of survival. So we're talking about the Decameron and, and the Tale of Tales, but you know, very famous frame tales uh, can also be found in the Arabian Nights and the Panchatantra and the Seven Sages and in many other collections. So in, in, um, in Boccaccio, the frame tale tells of, uh, uh, tells how the uh, plague, the Black Death of 1348 is ravaging the city of Florence. And um, it tells of the decision of these 10 young people to leave the city uh, and retire out to the countryside where they will uh, get a respite from the death that is occupying the city of Florence, uh, tell tales to kind of forget the, the brutal reality, but also tell tales to kind of imagine a better, a better future. In the tale of tales, we have a more fairy tale like situation in which a uh, uh, a wronged princess, Princess Zoza, who needs to get back her rightful husband, uses uh, uses the generation of tales to uh, to do that. I think you hopefully all remember the the frame tale situation. So the point here is that that um, frame tales often underline the vital importance of storytelling. Often a matter of life, life and death, literally. Um, Basile's frame tale uh, includes a very parodic reference to the Decameron. Um, so in Boccaccio, we have 10 young aristocratic Florentines, seven women, three men, who, uh, who are the tale tellers uh, of the collection. In Basile, we also have 10 tale tellers, but they're very different. Um, they are the most expert and quick-tongued tellers of the city, um, but they come in the form of 10 grotesque and deformed crones. Uh, just a few of the descriptions are lame Zedza, twisted Cheka, hunchbacked Popa, drooling Antonella, snout-faced Chula. They are grotesque, but they are also uh, the archetype of old wives, the old wives who tell fairy tales, uh, popular oral storytellers. So it's interesting how Basile both refers to Boccaccio, but kind of turns some of his paradigms on, on their head. Okay, and I know um, there was some, probably some perplexity about this subtitle, Entertainment for Little Ones. So I just wanna mention a, a, a few uh, ideas about that. So these, are, these tales are obviously not for little ones. They're written for a sophisticated adult audience, as we've already said. Um, and even if you didn't know that, I think it would be fairly clear through the, through the very Baroque use of language on Basile's part, the raunchiness of these tales, their indeterminate morality uh, uh, quite often. Um, so what, what does that little ones refer to? I think it may be a reference to the popular and folkloric culture that provides the raw materials for this collection. So in Basile's time, popular culture was commonly considered little or lower with respect to elite high culture. Um, so that might be one explanation. Uh, another one is that a genre presented as being something for little ones might not be considered as seriously. And so this could serve as kind of a protective or a defensive mechanism, um, allowing Basile greater liber liberties uh, to treat topics like sex or the critique of powers that be, for example. Okay, so now I'd like to uh, kind of get more into two, two specific tales, the Cinderella Cat 1-6 and the She Bear 2-6 uh, as a way of discussing how fairy tales in general engage with realities that uh, actually are very familiar to us. Um, there are hundreds of versions all over the world of both of these tales. Now, Cinderella is uh, the much better known of these tales. Uh, the she-bear, once the fairy tale became, um, uh, became a, a children's genre in the 19th century, kind of faded out because the she-bear tells a story of 
desired father-daughter incest, not consummated, but desired. And so I think it's clear why um, that sort of tale wouldn't, wouldn't be the sort of tale that uh, exists in a canon of uh, fairy tales for children. Um, but there, there are many versions of both all, all uh, over. Um, both tales in any case deal with dif dysfunctional families, extremely dysfunctional families. We see sibling rivalry, we see sexual jealousy, um, lack of maternal love, uh, abusive fathers. Um, and the neglect and sexual persecution of the daughters in these tales on the part of the king and the prince, um, I think may be part of a larger critique of corrupt royals who abuse their power on the part of Basile. Because in all of Basile's tales, there are actually very few kings who live up to their duties uh, of uh, you know, righteous, upstanding uh, royals. Uh, most of them have some kind of fatal flaw. Um, the two tales also have a related narrative structure, just kind of interesting how the absence of maternal love in Cinderella is countered by an, ex an excess, excuse me, an excess of paternal love in the she-bear. Um, and in the she-bear, we've got uh, the first episode of um, the uh, daughter's persecution by her father, um, but then a second episode in which she has a Cinderella-like uh, resurgence. Cinderella in general is considered as a tale of an underdog, um, although it's not always a rags to riches tale. Uh, after her demotion, Cinderella is, uh, is often um, kind of on the road simply to regain the place that she had at the beginning of the story. And that certainly is the case in Basile's version. Cinderella in general, again, has also come to be synonymous with certain female models of passivity and helplessness, the desire to be saved and so forth. For example, in Perrault's French version, um, she is described as a daughter whose gentleness and goodness were without parallel. In the Grimm's final version of, of their Cinderella, she was always good and said her prayers. Um, these are virtuous, pious Cinderella's who really have not that much to do with Basile's Zezola, his Cinderella cat, um, who, as you know, is a calculating and enterprising go-getter who kills her stepmother, her first stepmother, when she thinks she can get a better one. That's what's happening over here. Um, and then enjoys getting revenge on her mean sisters by stoking their envy. Um, Basile doesn't neglect to underline this calculating, scheming nature of Cinderella throughout the tale. Uh, at one point, um, before she leaves for the third evening of festivities, she's described like this. She was magnif magnificently dressed and placed in a golden coach, accompanied by so many servants that she looked like a whore arrested in the public promenade and surrounded by cops. And that is the word that Basile used, the vulgar word for, for prostitute, uh, which I translated rather, rather faithfully. Um, interestingly, in a 19th century translation, and many of these 19th century translations uh, tended to kind of sanitize Basile, we find this odd um, uh, kind of change in, in, in wording. Uh, in an instant, she was splendidly arrayed and seated in a coach of gold with ever so many servants around so that she looked just like a queen. Interesting. <laughs> in any case, Basile's Zezola, his Cinderella, inhabits a dog-eat-dog -dog world where she needs to get down and dirty and actively navigate her own destiny in order to get ahead. Uh, to survive, she has to do what she does here. And I just, this is kind of uh, exiting from Basile for a minute, but I think it's interesting how the Cinderella tale um, has often been used as a kind of meme for the American cultural narrative uh, regarding the ideals of virtue, honesty, hard work, perseverance, self-made man or woman, the American dream, whatever, and how these qualities will be rewarded by a rise in social or financial status, no matter how disadvantaged the starting point may be. 
But but in this narrative, there is no acknowledgement of the potential necessity of scheming, violence, deceit uh, in, in the rise to success, nor that Cinderella is often not a meritocratic rags to riches tale, but a tale of the rich regaining their wealth and even getting richer through some kind of magical advantage, which we may translate as having the right connections or something like that. Um, so I think this is a good example of how looking at earlier variants of well-known stories like Basile's can kind of illuminate their underside and help us to understand how tales have been used and abused uh, to promote certain ideologies. Um, the She-Bear is a tale of incest, as we've already mentioned, incest set in motion by uh, a dying mother who makes her husband promise that he will not remarry unless it's to someone as beautiful as she is. So right from the start, we see a shift of the focus of the blame away from the father and his depravity uh, and onto the, to, to the mother. Um, that said, however, this is one of a few tales where a female protagonist actually runs away. Um, this heroine has greater agency and resourcefulness than a lot of fairy tale heroines. She's disobedient, she's resistant. Um, she does also have to take on an animal form, the bear, uh, and kind of prove herself through various tests before she can reascend society, before she can re-enter a human dimension. This is also interesting um, because she seems to be freest when she's living as an animal actually which kind of begs the question of who the beast uh, actually is. Is society perhaps the most beastly dimension of all? And there are a number of fairy tales actually that, that ask these sorts of questions. Beauty and the Beast, for example. In any case, um, both of these tales lay bare certain dark familial societal realities, um, kind of between the once upon a time and the happily ever after victim blaming, child abuse, the liability of female beauty and of passive and virtuous, fe virtuous femininity, and the myth of romantic love. So Cinderella, Zezzola, and Preziosa um, don't marry because they fall madly in, in love with their princes, but simply as a survival tactic. They need to get out of their abusive families and into a more normal uh, uh, um, dynamic. Um, the Tale of Tales, talking about the Tale of Tales after Basile. Um, Chris, I'm just going to ask you if another five minutes is okay. I mean, I can stop here if, if, if you like. That sounds say? great. Five more minutes and then we'll take questions. Okay, okay. I'll try to talk fast. <laughs> um, the, so after Basile, the Tale of Tales had a, had a pretty successful publishing history in the 17th and 18th century. By the time we get to the 19th century, Folk tales, fairy tales um, are beginning to be seen as a, as the kind of the most genuine expression of a shared cultural heritage. And as such, they're being used to help affirm emerging national identities. Germany, for example, becomes a, you know, a nation, a political entity in the 19th century, as does Italy. Um, and on the other hand, fairy tales are also uh, becoming a staple of the new category of children's literature. So fairy tales uh, are starting to have a role in the education and socialization of children. So I think it's clear that an author like Basile with his explicitly sexual grotesque tales, these tales without clear lessons, um, kind of pessimistic very often, uh, these tales are rather poor candidates for entering into the fairy tale canon, whether that's for adults or children. And in general, Basile, when he is translated in the 19th century into English, and there are a number of translations, he's generally flattened, mutilated, sanitized in the, in the way that I uh, mentioned before, especially um, with certain types of tales or, or episodes. On the other hand, since the 1970s, so in the last half decade, half century or so, um, the tale of tales has resurfaced in translations, adaptations, and other cultural projects that recognize the extraordinary ability of this text 
to speak to our concerns today, to speak to contemporary concerns. Um, and that's perhaps because um, older non-canonical versions of fairy tales like Basile's give us a less of less of a black and white picture than their Grimm's or Disney counterparts. And this kind of aligns with the shifting focus of modern readers. We're, we're less interested, I think, in the idea that everything will work out at the end, the classic happy ending, and um, more curious about the specific problems of the fairy tales, the cracks in the fairy tales, um, since they reflect today's reality in a striking, striking fashion. Uh, I'm going to just skip that quote um, and I'm going to move on here. Um, I'm going to move on to talk about, uh, in conclusion, this wonderful film that you watched from 2015 by one of Italy's best known directors, Matteo Garrone. He's best known, actually, not for The Tale of Tales, but for his 2008 film, Gomorra, which is a gritty and very violent film on the Neapolitan mafia or Camorra. It's kind of a play on words there. Um, so <laughs> the Gomorra and the Tale of Tales would seem to be like two different planets almost, but Garona himself has stressed the similarities between the two. He says the stories of Gomorra are at the end dark fairy tales of violated childhood innocence. But whereas in Gomorra, I took real events and transfigured them, bringing them into a fantastic dimension. In the Tale of Tales, I do the opposite. I go from magical tales and try to bring them onto a more realistic plane. So it's interesting, the, the realism that all of these contemporary um, uh, readapters of Basile see in this collection from this weird and wonderful collection from almost 400 years ago. Both of these films for Garrone deal with radical dysfunctions of society and of family. And in fact, Garrone, um, he, he chooses only three of the, the, the tales from Basile, um, but three uh, surprisingly, in his view, modern tales of excessive desire and its monstrous consequences. And, and, and Garrone is constantly underlining the affinities between our postmodern sensibility and Basile's fairy tale world. So in The Flea, we get a distracted narcissistic father who neglects his daughter's well-being in favor of this obsession with fattening up a, a flea, um, which is kind of a case of genetic modification, we might say. And he then wagers his daughter off to, to an ogre uh, uh, who uh, marries her. In The Enchanted Doe, we have a mother who desperately desires a child, takes recourse to artificial insemination in the form of eating a sea monster's heart. Um, she loses her husband in the process. After she gives birth, she is then consumed by excessive and ultimately self-destroying maternal love and jealousy. And in The Old Woman Who Was Skinned, uh, we've got a sex-crazed king, an obsession, with self-image and reclaiming youth, even if it, if it involves self-mutilation and death. You may remember that in that story, the old woman, uh, one, of the, one of two old sisters is told by, uh, by her sister who has become through a magic spell, young and beautiful, that she did this by having herself skinned. So the other sister goes off to a barber and has herself skinned. Uh, to death. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the first literary <laughs> descriptions of a failed operation of cosmetic or plastic surgery. In all of these tales, outsized desires make functional and productive human relationships impossible, and in some cases, endanger life. So the, these are situations that are far from being ancient or quaint. They're, they're situations that are very much with us today. So to conclude, um, fairy tales, I mean, why is any of this important, we could ask. Fairy tales implot, continue to implot our lives and to structure our collective imaginary. They are, uh, and they, they've been, and they continue to be a major force of socialization and a source for our role models. Fairy tales, apart from the, the, the whole Disney phenomenon, they've had a huge influence uh, on the structure and content of novels, Hollywood films, and other popular media. Uh, and yet, although we are attracted to the happily ever after, we're also uh, attracted to 
again, the cracks in that structure. And I think we recognize that happily ever after is an artificial milestone beyond which lie darker and messier tales that never really do reach an ending, happy or not. Basile's tales are a prime example of that. Fairy tales stage conflicted dialogues with the world around us. They ask us things like, what do I have to do to obtain this, to be successful in society? What does that cost me? And is that always compatible with being a good and happy human being? And so I think that discovering tales like Basile's, and there are many others that still have to be discovered uh, by, by a general public, I think that it opens our perspectives to different times and spaces by showing how others have struggled to answer those same questions that I just mentioned, to comprehend the world and to resolve their life dilemmas. So that is it. <laughs> Thank you, and I'm sorry if I... Um, Wonderful. I'm, I'm Wonderful sorry. Presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> round of applause. I don't know what the emoji is for the round of applause. There we go. Um, so I will open it up, open it up to questions. Um, and a lot of you finished your final papers for the course on Basile. So I'm sure it's fresh in your minds and you do have some questions uh, regarding the presentation or perhaps uh, even from your papers. I would uh, love. I would love, frankly, to hear about some of the topics of the, the papers, which are which is also a way of saying what you found most interesting about Basile, right? I actually am um, very honored to have you speak because I actually used um, one of your quotes, the uh, one of your quotes that you actually used tonight in my conclusion for my paper. So my uh, paper was over comparing the Walt Disney version of Cinderella and the Cinderella cat. And just all the different like yes there are there are some comparisons but the contrasts in the disney version kind of take away from a lot of the elements that basile put in there for a reason of connection and familiarity between the readers and things like that so it was absolutely it was really cool to hear you say the quote that i used so it was really that's honored that's to hear that. yeah yeah that really pops out i mean basile Basile's language is so weird that, I mean, there's so much of it that's that's weird that sometimes even quotes like that don't don't pop out, but but that one often does with, with students, I find. Yeah, great. So you are pro Basile. <laughs> yes, most definitely. Now, because I, I actually didn't know this version existed. So when we when I we initially started reading this book, I was very in shock because I had never read something like this before, and even the Decameron and everything like that before just kind of showing like the exposure that I haven't had and I'm gonna keep digging from here on out because these are amazing. I would say that's a typical, very common reaction that I find in my students as, as well in, in the courses on fairy tales that I, that I teach. It's a big revelation, but as you say, initial, initially a shock as well when they encounter Basile. Please don't be shy, ask questions. I wanted to let you know um, that our, our president is also tuning in. So that's exciting. President oh, Mupay, great. Right. I'm honored. We have um, a few professors. If you're interested in, in asking questions, please do so. Thank you for joining us. Um, students, that I know you did see the film. So um, if you have questions also about um, Garone's representation. He also did Pinocchio, which maybe next semester I'll try to present. I think it's a wonderful version of Pinocchio, much better than Benigni's version. He's a very, very interesting director. Yeah. I have to say that the first time I saw that film, I wasn't, I liked it, but I wasn't super, super enthused. But then I've, you know, since I've watched it a number of times and I really do love it now. Um, he, Garone started off his um, artistic life as a painter. And I think especially in that film, you really see the painterly uh, Garone, his, his just, you know, the use of, of colors and, you know, the lavish costumes and landscapes and, and things is just quite incredible. The scene too with the river, it's in Sicily. I've been there, it's La Gola and something, I forgot, but fascinating place if you're ever in yeah. Sicily. The places in Italy that he chose for, his settings are just amazing, yeah. But I'm really interested in hearing from more students. Um, if you liked Basile, what you wrote your papers on, um, 
how just how your views of fairy tales, I mean, this wasn't a course on fairy tales, but you've certainly read a lot of them, how, how they've changed by, uh, you know, through your, your acquaintance with, with Basile. Um, okay. Okay. I, I don't know if I have a specific question exactly, but uh, something that I certainly noticed, um, you know, you, you mentioned it at the start of your, your talk that uh, we typically think of fairy tales as, you know, children's literature, you know, especially in the contemporary period, it's, you know, stuff that's targeted toward children and whatnot. But you got me thinking a lot about how the form has changed over the centuries. Um, and something that I, again, this isn't much of a question, so forgive me, but uh, one of the things that you highlighted in your presentation that I think is interesting is uh, you you mentioned that other translation of that line from the Cinderella cat and how it kind of defangs the uh, the prose, for lack of a better word. Um, I, I'm trying to think of a way to kind of mold this into a question, but I, I think that that really highlights, you know, the importance of like accurate translations and not kind of, you know, removing the teeth from a lot of what we read, especially from stuff uh, from other, you know, nations with different languages and such. Mm -hmm. Apologies, it's not really a question. It's just something I noticed. Those are all great points. And, and as I pointed out uh, briefly, but, you know, you could do a whole uh, talk on this. Um, what happens with the fairy tale in the 19th century is, is very interesting. Um, the way that it's used as kind of a, uh, an instrument for kind of affirming national cultural heritages, but also the, 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 the way that it, its functions shift in, into, in the direction of becoming a genre, increasingly so as the century uh, wears on for, for children. And so the translations um, into, into English, but also into other languages that are done in the 19th century, um, you know, they're generally done for commercial reasons. In other words, the translators want to present their translations as books that will sell to a general audience. In order for that to happen, they need to dumb down an author like Basile, as I said, sanitize, or as you said, Eric, defang Basile in order for that to be possible because fairy tales are no longer the domain only of these kind of elite courtly audiences, but they, they've come to be a genre for a general public, for children, for their parents who are reading or telling them to them. And so Basile doesn't quite make the mark in that particular context. So we really have to wait until the 20th century to get more, you know, faithful philological translations. Um, and, and today, yes, the fairy tale is mostly associated with, with children, but not exclusively. In the past 50 years or so, there have been uh, a number of, of, of writers who have taken up the fairy tale as an adult genre. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the wonderful British writer, she's, she's dead now, Angela Carter, but she has a collection called The Bloody Chamber, which I highly recommend. Her language is very Baroque. Uh, I, I kind of sometimes see uh, glimmers of, of Basile in her, um, but she rewrites, you know, very uh, common, uh, commonly known fairy tale types, Beauty and the Beast. She has three versions of Little Red Riding Hood and others uh, in a very subversive uh, way. And her tales are, are really for, 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 for an adult audience, not at all for, for a young audience. So in a sense, things have kind of come full circle in that there are many uh, very uh, sophisticated writers who don't write exclusively fairy tales, but who include fairy tales in the genres that they take up because they feel as Basile did that um, one can say a lot about the world uh, around uh, uh, one by using, by writing in the genre of fairy tale. Okay, we have another question here. Um, I'm more of a comment, but I guess it could turn into a question. So I'm an element, uh, elementary school teacher. So for me, it was really interesting taking this course just because I've done children's literature and stuff before. So focused on like the Grimm's and all of those versions of the fairy tales. So I was used to those more so than like, obviously I grew up on Disney, but then seeing all of it now, it's just really interesting. And your presentation did a really good job of explaining 
with time, how it's changed and kind of how you just said, now, now it's kind of going back into that way. This is an adult, like I, I am an elementary school teacher, but I also, I love like the murder documentaries and everything, like they're kind of weird but like that. So reading back on these, like it's interesting to see more of like the, the like the language being more aggressive and things like that to see how it's more sugar you know? So it was just a comment I had in but it was very cool to see. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. And actually even speaking of, um, you know, ver contemporary versions of fairy tales that kind of subvert the tradition for young people. There's plenty of that too, which I'm sure you're familiar with some, uh, I, I'm sure you're all, you all read some of these books as children, like the, you know, the, um, can never pronounce his last name. It's, I think it's Polish, John Suzika, the sticky cheese and other tales. That's an extremely creative and kind of transgressive um, revisitation of, of a number of different fairy tales. Um, but there, you know, there are versions of Little Red Riding Hood that take part that take place in New York uh, with various, you know, urban predators and versions of Cinderella, where she kind of takes things in her own hands. And uh, could you just, I mean, remind me, you young people, of things that you uh, of fairy tales of that sort that you read as 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 kids. Did is this sounding familiar? Did you read? There's a lot of them, and then usually called fractured fairy tales, I think, and it's a huge genre now. So yeah, yeah I've read yeah, quite a few yeah. of them. And actually, it has been since those first fractured fairy tale. I mean, I think that term comes from the cartoons uh, mm -hmm. from the 1960s that I grew up with, the fractured fairy tales, which are hysterically funny and kind of, in a sense, um, uh, you know, heralded in that 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 trend. Yeah, I mean, it's a whole huge category, right? questions. Could you speak to your translation? Uh, because uh, we find it fascinating. We have two Italianists in the class and the idea of going from Tuscan Italian to, to English is already difficult in itself. So going from the Neapolitan dialect to, to English, how did you do that? Well, I noticed one of the questions was, how long did it take you? And I'm kind of embarrassed to, to answer that one. It took me a really long time. You know, I was doing other things. I was teaching and other other projects, but it, it probably took, you know, seven or eight years um, to, to finish the translation. Um, so I, uh, I, you know, I've spent some time in Naples, but not really extended periods. I worked a lot from dictionaries. I am familiar with some other Southern Italian dialects. Dialects are still spoken today in, in Italy. It's a very interesting linguistic situation in Italy that really isn't um, comparable to, to anything in, in, in this country. Um, and so uh, it, uh, and, and so as I was saying, besides the fact that he's writing in dialect, and I had to familiarize myself with that through dictionaries, through grammars, et cetera, his version of dialect is very, very unique. Um, it's kind of this hybrid language where he brings in a lot of elements from what was the literary Italian uh, back then and kind of dialectizes <laughs> uh, them. So that was a big uh, kind of learning uh, curve. Um, that I had to uh, that I had to go through, and then you 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 saw from reading his tales that he loves these long long descriptions, long lists of of insults, of um, uh, you know uh, types of dress, of of fish, of foods, and so on and so forth. And so I I you know what really I remember most of all is these long afternoons. Um, trying to decipher, I remember in particular, trying to decipher a list of fish, many of which exist only in the Mediterranean anyway. <laughs> and then it was a different word from the Italian as well. And just like, you know, mamma mia, what am I, what am I gonna do here? Um, so it was a long, long process. I, I, I describe my approach um, in translating Basile as, um, kind of productively foreignizing. And by that, I mean that I really, it was very important to me to maintain the weirdness of Basile. Um, he's, he's rather uh, hard, I think in a good way, but still hard to read um, even for an Italian, probably even for you know, a Neapolitan of his time, he would have been a little bit, uh, you know, it would have been a, a little bit labor intensive to, to read him. 
And so I didn't want to make the, the, the task of a you know, 21st century um, Anglophone reading public any easier because I felt that that would be kind of you know, betraying him. At the same time, I did want to maintain a readability of sorts, just, just as I was also kind of respecting the complexity of the text. And um, I don't know, you know, you tell me, <laughs> how did you find the translation? There are a lot of footnotes too. Um, what I was saying about how Basile, how Basile's text is kind of this anthropological, um, anthropologically wonderful storehouse of information. Um, I just felt like I had to uh, include some notes that described, you know, what the heck he was he was talking about. Um, I don't know. You know, you tell me. I I I'm not. <coughs> excuse me. I'm not offended. I actually like feedback. Uh, along the lines of, well, uh, you know, it could have been a little bit more readable or um, because I am a translator, you know, I continue to translate other things and, and uh, you know, I need to know what, what, what my public thinks too. <laughs> so, so Emily or Amy, any thoughts oh, on me. translation? Both of you are the Italianists in the group. Emily and Amy. Amy. <laughs> Well, Emily and Amy, did you did you attempt to read, I don't know, the Neapolitan, which would have been really hard going, or you know, an Italian because there are Italian translations from the Neapolitan as well. Did you attempt that at all? I wanted to. I didn't get to, so I'm a little sad about that. I might do that later when I have time. Sure. Um, but I thought the translations were good. Like I thought it was very readable. I really liked it. Um, I didn't know about Bazile before. And when I read it, I just thought it was amazing. And I really love all the stories that I read. It was just so good. Somehow it all works. I mean, so he's he's basically kind of flooding the bare structure of these tales, which as I said, they're not, ta they're not tales that he invented. So people were telling Cinderella tales before him. People were telling, you know, Rapunzel type tales, but he floods these, these structures with a lot of other stuff, um, but it but it all seems to work somehow. And some of some of the tales are just so funny. Um, one slide that I didn't include, which I had originally wanted to, um, was a series of quotes from a tale that I think you read, the cockroach, the mouse, and the cricket, um, that tells of a, a, a of a young man who makes a princess laugh and, and by doing this is promised her hand in marriage. Uh, but when her father finds out that he's kind of a ragamuffin, he no longer wants to, to marry her to him. So he substitutes this, the first guy with a, with a German, more respectable German. Um, and the, the, the husband who's had his wife taken away from him with the help of these little insect magic helpers that he has, um, uh, initiate this hysterical series of scenes in the wedding bed where each of the insects um, uh, causes the German on three subsequent nights to have explosions of diarrhea in the, in the bed. But what I'm getting at is that the, in the description of these outpourings in the bed, Basile uses citations from some of the, um, the uh, kind of most revered icons of European literature. So in, in one case, he, he uses Petrarch, the, the love poet par excellence, who's kind of a model for European poetry to comment on the, 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 the explosion of diarrhea in the bed. And in another, uh, on another night, he uses a line from Virgil's Aeneid uh, to do the same sort of thing. Um, so he's, you know, there's just all sorts of material in this in this collection. You know, myth as I said, mythology and you know, contempt the contemporary high culture that Basile himself was working in as a court uh, intellectual, and he just like stuffs it all in there, and it, it all just just works and is is terribly funny a lot of the time. And it's in that intersection too between the high and low, low culture, right? Yeah, it's in yeah. together. Wonderful. Any final thoughts or questions? Professor Kaneta, please, please don't be shy. Well, I know one of the things that we talked about a lot in our small groups when we break out were the, the artwork that was included in the um, book and 
how we found it like disturbing but funny and we I think a lot of us it really resonated with the story I don't know if you wanted to speak on that or I'd love to um that's my husband <laughs> he did the illustrations we've collaborated on a few uh, illustration translation projects. My my translation of Pinocchio, he also illustrated. Um, and he he is actually not from Naples, but from the south of, of Italy, from the other side, Puglia of, of the south. Um, and so he, uh, you know, he grew up not necessarily hearing Basili, but hearing a lot of those, those tales and other forms. Um, and uh, he, um, you know, he definitely gets the spirit of, of Basile. And so it's, it's, Good to hear. You know, not everyone likes those illustrations because they are a little bit, they can be a little bit jarring. Um, so thank you for <laughs> sharing your your uh, feelings about them. I'll tell him. <laughs> yes, do let him know. Even Elizabeth, I think, or it was Jillian, another student commented on the illustrations uh, during <laughs> class. So thank you. Final questions. What are some of your other paper topics? Just really quickly, I'm, I'm interested. Please, let's go through everyone and tell you if you can tell her your paper topic, please. Um, I did the hidden symbolism in found in within Basile. Uh huh. So like um like the forest and stuff like that. That's interesting, these kind of archetypal uh symbols. So in particular tales or or like the forest across many different tales? It, across many different tales. I did the forest and then the Wicked Stepmothers and those kind of stuff. Oh, cool. Any final revelations, things that you came to that you hadn't thought of before? Um, no, I, I found that some people thought that the forest was like um, kind of like another meaning for like uh, feminine, feminine, like the so that was kind of interesting. I thought that was kind of interesting, but um, no, it was just basically trying to cope with what was going on around them or to like kind of give, you know, insight to that kind of stuff. So that was pretty much what I got from it, so. Great, great, sounds really interesting. So I wrote about um, the myth Psyche in Cupid in this old woman who was skinned. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of what I was looking at. Cause I found, I don't know, I found that tale be pretty disturbing but also fascinating so I wanted to do something on that. It's my favorite tale because I think it represents what Basile is doing overall so so well um, you know the kind of troubled nature of, of his fairy tale world. It is it is a troubling tale um, but uh, it's also one of the few tales that we think Basile may actually have invented so that's to say there are versions um, not not as many versions as for other tales, but they all seem to come after Basile. Um, so that's that's interesting too. Next. Uh, for my paper, I looked at anthrop what is it called? Anthropomorphism and zoomorphism and how they're used in adult fairy tales. And it's pretty different from childlike fairy tales with that. Um, it's very more mature, like I used uh, Kaiyoso and the she bear to represent those. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. The whole um, the whole idea of you know beastliness in fairy tales is is very interesting, and those questions of who actually is the beast, uh, and who you know is humanity more beastly than the beastly. Um, Angela Carter in that collection of tales that I mentioned, the, the Bloody Chamber, toys a lot with, with those sorts of um, uh, uh, questions. Like in one of her versions of Beauty and the Beast, the beauty figure actually becomes a beast at the end as a way of escaping from a very uh, repressive kind of patriarchal society in which her father actually had sold her off uh, mm -hmm. to the beast um, who's not so beastly uh, when he lost at a game of cards. Um, so so that, that's a really central issue in a lot of fairy tales. Yeah, the, the human versus the animal. Next. Other topics? Um, I wrote mine on like the different historical perspectives and like how it's evolved over time and like the mythical creatures like fairies 
how like the writers um, were commonly women back in the day and the fairies were actually intended to like represent midwives and people who like had worked with children and stuff. And I thought that was really cool and kind of powerful to give like more autonomy to like women and kind of like give them cool representations throughout the stories. And I just thought that was really cool to find out. Interesting. I'm so impressed because it seems like all of you did a lot of kind of uh, critical and secondary reading too, right? Great. Yeah, uh, for mine, I wrote uh, something of a feminist analysis or perhaps even a critique of Sun, Moon, and Talia mm -hmm. because uh, the gender politics, for lack of a better word, of some of the tales were a bit shocking. And that one in particular stood out to me quite a bit. So I, I, I felt kind of compelled to talk about that from a bit of a feminist perspective. Absolutely. Yeah, that together with Cinderella, I would say, is one of the biggest shockers of the collection. So that's a version of Sleeping Beauty, right? In which yes, the, mm -hmm. in which the king rapes uh, the Sleeping Beauty character. Um, you don't see that in the Disney movie. <laughs> no, you don't. Oh. And basically in no other version. Um, and again, I mean, you could read that in terms of very troubling gender politics, as you just said. You could also uh, you could also kind of hypothesize that Basile is just, again, kind of laying bare what is always there uh, in even in other versions in terms of objectification of, um, you know, comatose, semi-dead women. Oh, yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I didn't touch on it in my paper as much as I would have liked, but I, I definitely mentioned, you know, that aspect of it, how even more contemporary adaptations still kind of play into the same creep factor for lack of a better word <laughs> yeah 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 Any others I'd like to share the paper or uh professor fur you perhaps you have a question i, I do you, but i prefer hearing from students okay. <laughs> but I, i'm kind of if i can jump in real quick I, i'm interested in like the ideological function of the tales and and also you gesture to the port cities and the origins and you know to cultural exchange and the and and even figuring in the structural transformation of the public sphere but i'm also really interested in in the what i kind of see possibly as indigenous sort of influences which you, you gestured to at the beginning but um like even the animals and the anthropomorphication of them uh like there's in a similar period 16th 17th century um, exploration narratives in North America, a uh, native guide is guiding it on Anglo the settler. And the uh, settler mentions how stupid the uh, beaver is, is what a weird animal. And the, the, the native person says, every animal is smarter than you. And, um, and so I kind of, I just see these sort of, also the tale far, far away in a distant land, you know, it reminds me of Ben Franklin and then the salons in Paris talking about the savage remarks on the Native Americans. And they produce a critique of the missionaries, you know, and they can feel the salon all laughing because, and so I'm just wondering if, and I, certainly the Far East is a, probably a major or more um, influence on their rise and that sort of nexus in Italy in the 15th, 16th centuries. But what about indigenous sort of um, connections, if, if any? Well, I mean, that is probably where Basile got most of his tales. So Naples is kind of mid, mid South Italy, and then the deep South of Italy, Calabria uh, and Puglia on the other side, th th those areas are actually where Basile spent long periods of his life as kind of a neo-feudal administrator, which he wasn't that happy about. He has some kind of uh, uh, comic letters that he wrote from some of these locations saying, basically, get me out of here. But in those same letters, he also makes references to not, I, there's nothing to do here, but to hear these little stories that people are telling, which I think are probably the, the stories that then made their way into, uh, you know, into his, his uh, tale of tales. Um, so uh, that, you know, even more than, so he, he was also in, in Crete, uh, and you know, traveled a bit about the Mediterranean, but most of his time was spent there in the south of Italy, which is, for example, in the 19th century, the uh, Sicily and the south of Italy are some of the regions where the richest 
anthologies of uh, folklore and folk tales, uh, you know, emerge from. Um, because it's, you know, a very, uh, very kind of rural agricultural, agriculture-based uh, 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 economy down there and really has, has, has always been. I mean, the, the uh, proto-capitalist uh, order of the, uh, you know, communes in the cen center and north of Italy that started to uh, take shape in the 13th century really never got to the south, which is, I just, briefly alluded to, the South was under Spanish uh, colonial rule for uh, like three or four centuries from the 15, 1400s to the 1700s. Um, so th that is, uh, you know, Basile is definitely getting his material from uh, the, the local realities uh, around him. Um, it's, it's sometimes hard to kind of separate out <laughs> What uh, you know, what he uh, what he infuses into the tales from the elements that he uh, you know that he uh, kind of takes and just uh, uh, recycles and puts put, puts into his tales. Um, right, and it, it it seems like the genres of this period, like all of them, are all that come to my mind: satire, pol political satire. There's the, even Pamela, the early novels. There's a roundabout critique of power, even the trade letters. And, uh, and it seems like these fairy tales are almost like the synth, but they offer subversive thoughts as well as ones of assimilation. And so I, the, the, the genre is a critique of power and, and, and the nobility in particular. I, so I just see it translating like Franklin kind of adopts the fairy tale structure and, and uses it, you know, to his own sort of secular benefit and polit political, you know, amusement, but. He, he does, yeah, he does definitely do that. Um, he, uh, you know, he was, a, as I said, a relatively successful man of letters, but he wasn't necessarily too satisfied with that life. There are other letters of his in which he complains about, you know, just always having to write things for the wedding of so-and-so and, you know, really meaning nothing to him and, his employees, his employers, who, uh, when they have no use for him, just kind of, uh, you know, throw him, throw him aside. On the other hand, I mean, there there have been critics who have, um, who have put forth the idea that Basile had these kind of popular sympathies. I'm not quite sure I I, I subscribe to that. I mean, he really was, you know, he was uh, he 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 was for his entire life a court intellectual and I'm not sure and, and very well ensconced in that in that world. I mean his sister was a probably the most famous um, opera virtuosa of, of the age and he was kind of involved in, in that life as well. Um, but uh, so you know I, I definitely think that he was that there is this critique of, of, of power in the tale of tales but it's kind of from inside the system <laughs> in, a, in a certain sense, you know, he's not, I don't think he's going out in the south of Italy and kind of schmoozing with the locals and doing that, that, that sort of thing. Um, that's well, biting the hand of the dog that feeds or dog biting the hand that feeds. Yeah, more, more like that. You know, it's, I think it's important not to kind of impose romantic notions of, uh, of, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, you know, of a sympathy toward the working class and the poor, the yeah, peasantry. The of intellect, right, when, you know, the working class in a modern sense didn't even exist. Right. Then, especially in that area, yeah. Fair yeah. enough. Okay, I think we are going to end it. We did go 24 minutes over. Yikes, um, I, sorry. I'm not, I'm not good with time, <laughs> uh, but thank you for your presentation. It was such an honor to have you with us. Um, and uh, I asked uh, students, you know, to finish reading the entire um, the entire 50 fairy tales, right? 49 plus the, the frame fairy tale, uh, maybe over the holidays. Um, and um, until next time, it was such a pleasure. Thank you. We'll do the emotions. Thank you. I, I enjoyed your talk very much. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed being here. And um, please, if you, Chris, if you want the PowerPoint, if anyone is interested in uh, in, in looking at it. You have a longer version of it. You could just share that one. Um, okay. And, you know, if any of you have questions, any of you students have questions that you'd like to pose at a, at a later time, I'm always happy to, uh, you know, to communicate with, with young minds. They're the most exciting ones in my view. <laughs>
Thank you, Chris. Grazie mille. Grazie. Prego, grazie. Bye, everyone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um,